Hey gang, if you if we are live, I just to fill you in. I'm doing this for the first time through a different set of streaming software than I normally do. So I've got Patrick on. He came on a few minutes early, and we were just kind of shooting the breeze and, and getting caught up. And uh, and then I launched the stream, and I thought it was going to launch a different window, and it threw me a curveball. So all right, I think everybody's here. Looks like Brian's here. Terrence is here. Shadow Patriot. All right, looks like everybody's in here. Hey gang. This. Okay. So uh, welcome to Night Shift Live. It's a very special episode, and uh, I'm joined by a very special guest today. Patrick from Vetted has dropped by, and we're going to pick his brain and try to melt it a little bit later on with some uh, clips that uh, have been blowing my mind lately. And uh, welcome, man. It's great to have you here. Yeah, man. Super stoked to be here. This is awesome. I can't wait. Thank you for coming on Vetted, and um, I'm stoked to be here, man. You cover so much on your channel. You're doing a video every day. Um, hey, hang on, Clint. I don't think we're on, dude. You don't think we're on? Uh-uh. I'm on the YouTube page, like, for this. Hang on a second. You've been live for 10 minutes, dudes. <laughs> it says we're live right now. Does That's it? weird. Are we on, guys? Are we Are we on? I, I can't see it. Okay. Maybe it's just me. My, my bad, then. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, hold up. Let me see if I can put this in the chat. I, 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 I'm probably crazy. I don't think you are. I think we're, uh, here we go. This is even more fun. Oh, it is. Okay. It's working. I had to refresh the window. I had to. Okay. All right. So no, we're good. We're good. We're good. Okay. All right. Hey, <laughs> this is what you come here for people. No one else is giving you this kind of content. This is where it comes <laughs> from right here. We got to, we're winging it every day. And uh, actually we were just talking about that, Patrick, just a few minutes ago. It's like, that's funny. you got to make it up as you go sometimes. And uh, that's right. <laughs> here we are. So, Patrick, you're doing a video a day. You're covering a lot of stuff. You cover a lot of ground. You're one of the very few people, it seems, who has a a 360-degree kind of picture at any given moment of the top stories and what's going on in this space. What have you been seeing lately? Is there something that's come across your radar that is a particularly interesting story or something that stands out for you? Like, what what's on your mind lately? What are you seeing? Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think really just, you know, there's a lot like on the cusp, you know, those games when you go to the arcade and it's got all those coins and they're hanging on this like, <laughs> you know, yeah. metal thing and it's pushing it. And there's all these coins getting ready to just tumble over and you keep slotting in coins and it keeps pushing it. And you're like, oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh. That's where I feel like we're at. We've got Luis Elizondo's book, Eminent, coming out. We've got James Fox's documentary, The Program, coming out. Now we just heard about George Knapp's new project that's coming out and potentially this like new USO video coming out before the end of the year. We've got the hearings potentially, uh, or at least one. Uh, they're working on this UAP you know, amendment. We'll know that by the end of the year if they signed it in December, right? So, and who knows? what else i don't even know i may i may have missed something um so there's a lot coming out that's kind of what i'm looking forward to the most is just a lot of that uh, sort of stuff just seeing what's going to be the next domino to fall yeah there'll be a lot of things that come out of all that right and yeah. a lot of people are holding on to stuff waiting for these projects to come out right if that makes yeah. sense right so there's a lot of like citizen you know disclosure happening which is cool too which is very cool too. People going out and doing their own thing. People are having X spaces and you know blowing the whistle or what what have you, um, and people just doing their own thing. I.e. Ashton Forbes, John Stewart, right? People like that who just kind of roll up their do sleeves you, and go for it. Do you think there's more? And this goes for the audience too. I'm curious in the chat what you guys think. Do you think there's more activism and there's more of a groundswell of of uh, of support for disclosure and pushing this thing through and is it actually getting more serious or are we just in the bubble so much that for us it looks like there's a lot of stuff happening because that's all we think about all the time but do you think it's just going more mainstream every day is, is, is this still expanding outward that's a good question i mean that's probably hard to quantify you know in totality um Maybe in certain pockets, the needles moved and others not, right? Someone may say, well, my group of family friends, it's, it's, we can talk about it now. Other people yeah. may say, no, it's gotten worse. I mean, I don't know. That's interesting. Um, culturally, is it more open to talk about, right? Um, I don't know. That's, that's definitely a good question. I think it kind of has in a lot of ways, just because there's so 
much out there. Um, and if you do kind of scratch the surface a little, you know, before when you looked into it, you, we all know what you were going to find, right? Just documentaries and these books and the, pretty much yeah. the same old, same old. Now, when you people, if they want to get into it, they're like, oh, hearings, congressional testimony, you know, amendments, uh, Chuck Schumer, right? There's, there's these other things that like, maybe there's something, you know, going on, you know, so that's, that's kind of different for people, I think, who maybe initially maybe is equally skeptical, but once they pass, you know, once they get to first base, it first base looks a lot different, but maybe, you know, home base does. How, how old is vetted right now? Roughly. Over a, a year, uh, right? Just over a year? Where we launched the channel in June last year. Like, that's when I posted my first video, mid-June. But I started doing the daily videos, like, every day, not missing a day over Labor Day. I did daily videos before that, but I missed a lot of days. And it was over Labor Day. I said, okay, from this day forth, <laughs> I shall not miss a day. So I'm kind of going to be celebrating one year over Labor Day of like really what bet it is right now. Wow. Well, congratulations, by the way, for that, because that's an amazing achievement. It's a lot of work. Has, Thank you. Yeah. In that time, has your, I know that when we first talked, it was when you had just kind of really launched the channel and started to get some forward momentum going. And yeah, uh, that's when we talked the first time. And you were, you were pretty skeptical about a lot of this stuff when you first approached it. You came at it with kind of a, a very, you know, show me the money kind of a mindset. That's, that was my impression anyway. Has your uh, perspective changed on any of this stuff after doing it day in and day out for over a year now? Oh, definitely. It's just been a roller coaster ride up and down. I'm still equally a skeptical, but I'm just more open to, you know, listening and diving in and taking in information and seeing it for what it is. Uh, you know, a lot of things are just ambiguous at the end of the day. There's yeah. no way to tell one way or the other. So I just leave it there. Why do I need to make a decision one way or the other about everything? You know what I mean? Right. Right. So, you know, and I'm running a channel trying to report on other people. It's not just about me. Right. right. Like my personal feelings really don't matter. My my goal is to provide information for a wide spectrum of people and their beliefs. Right. So that's mainly what I focus on. You know, my but have you seen my like stuff. any has anything that you've covered flipped your mind one way or the other on anything in particular like do we or don't we have a crash disc or do we or don't we have bodies or did you have you seen anything that's really been like compelling for you i mean that's that's a good question for sure and I, that's a question i would ask to be honest with you you know not i mean not really i've the thing is is you might see something it's kind of washes itself it kind of averages itself out because you might see something that's like this is compelling Right. And then you see some other stuff that's complete BS and it can wash itself out a little bit um, it, mentally, even though you should look at it more objectively and not, you know, one shouldn't pay for the sins of the other. Right. In, in a way. But just I'm human. So collectively, it can start to go back and forth. But. I mean. There's definitely a lot of compelling stuff out there. Right. Uh, that we just don't know what it is that that i think is what i've sort of established as a fact that i didn't know before which is there are things flying around and we just don't know what they are that in and of itself is scary right could one of yeah. the things be this other thing well yeah a lot of people have a lot of stories and there's a lot of evidence out there i just haven't seen any proof but i've seen a lot of evidence for sure. For a lot of compelling stuff to continue to look into, which is why I look forward to all of these um, things coming out and more people coming out to testify and whistleblowers. And I'm, I'm here for it. I think that's something that we've been focused on over here a lot is the sense that, uh, or at least uh, that's the, the vibe that I'm getting is that this is getting, it, it's building to something, right? Like now that yeah. like you said there wasn't legislation before, then there was legislation. Then they gutted it and kicked it back. And you'd think, okay, well, if this is all a big waste of time, then they would, everybody would walk away. But they double yeah. down. They come back, and they come at it with Schumer 2.0. Sure. And now, 
you know, we're going to double down on this whole push. And it seems like a lot more people are working full time on having this conversation and, and doing it in a, a serious way. Do you have the sense that things have picked up speed and is this like heading towards something or are we just, is this still just another step on a very long 60, 70 year? Like, are we going to be doing this 10 years from now the same way we're doing it today? Or do you think that this is going to end up somewhere with disclosure or what's your temperature check on the situation? Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely a good question. Um, that's something I've thought about a lot. Qu questions I ask myself, the same question, right? Again, it's very nuanced because politically movements, if we were to just take away the UFO aspect and just look at it as a political movement, mm -hmm. right, for, for this disclosure, political movements notoriously can take a long time, decades. Some can take, very few happen just overnight. I mean, when, when does that happen? When does some yeah. movement happen, like, legislatively, and it just, like, changes, like, outright, you know? Now, if if somehow there was this forced disclosure and it happened, then you would see legislation move like that, right? To, right? to sort of catch up to to some things. But if the idea is disclosure coming from the legislation, it, it could go at a snail's pace, right? And that does it. It's discouraging or encouraging just depending on how you look at life and how you look at the, the legislative process. Are you patient with it? Do you understand that it takes a long time? Sometimes you got to reintroduce an amendment 10 times it, right. it could take a decade i mean it could take a long time depending on what the battles are we don't know all the nuances right that's happening behind the scenes and all the chess pieces that are being moved and we know publicly some things and even that's you know that information isn't even particularly verifiable half the time everyone's got an insider that's throwing out all kinds of information <laughs> about it's always another how, book right yeah it's like well, one more book just wait for not it, the even next a book, book just just yeah. tweeting about it or something right or on a podcast episode talk, you know in some interview and it's again just publicly what we know is is all over the place so imagine privately so i don't know it, in a way it you know is the glass half full or half empty to you right it, it, right i look at it positively like we, we've done things we hadn't done before that to me should be the gauge. Okay, we've made movements we haven't made before, or in a early, or in decades, right? So right. that to me is a movement towards, you know, the right direction. In the right direction, yeah. And it it seems like there's every once in a while there are these just sort of outlier stories. Have you been following this um, Peru mummy thing very much? The Nazca mummies. The Nazca mummies, yeah. Yeah, I um. Sort of. I mean, do you have a specific question or? Well, I'm or just curious. Just... You know, I saw there was a story today, and um, let me see if I can pull it up here. It was, um, oh, that's Gary McKinnon. Hold on a second. I, I you know, quickly while you're looking that up, I am going to cover it uh, with Pavel. And I asked him, like, I don't know, maybe a couple weeks ago, hey, man, I want to do a story on the Nazca mummies, you know, help me out, whatever. So he said, hey, I, I, I want it because I wanted him to come on. He said he was going to come on, but he wanted to wait till more information came out and more stuff was going to be coming out. So I am going to get to it eventually and cover it, which is why I haven't covered it on Bedded in a while, just because I have behind the scenes sort of waiting for some stuff to drop that's apparently coming that'll make covering, you know, catching everybody up uh, essentially is what I'm going to do here, uh, hopefully within the next few weeks. Uh it's just there's so, there's always so much. I mean, it's hard. It's really hard to stay on top of all this stuff, and that's why I, the only reason I asked you is because I haven't been covering. It. I kind of like I haven't yeah. looked at the Nazca mummies, but I I probably yeah. should. And and that there was an article that just dropped today, and I'll share it with you now. Let me just put it on the sure. screen share. And I thought we would just go through this and get your uh, shout out to up. chat. Shout out to all the betters watching. Let me see if I can pull this up. I see you, Jessica. There it is. All right. Hopefully this will go through without a hitch. Okay, so it's the Daily Mail, which, you know, <laughs> first it's like a, it's an advertisement uh, nightmare. But um, how do I close all this shit? There we go. <laughs> so this is the, uh, the headline, U.S. Congress to investigate controversial Peru alien mummies amid fears they could be linked to UFOs. And the article basically is, I wonder if there's just a reader mode that I could just do on this. Um, they're basically saying, and this is Tim Burchett, um, they've earmarked like over a million bucks to have the University of Tennessee um, 
there's a group there. They have a, a, a place called the Body Farm, and it's their they're forensic anthropologists. And so they look at um, decomposing bodies to try farm. and figure out. Holy God, that's a great name for a horror movie. It's the best. That's the best. Right? It's the uh, Body Farm. Holy the shit. The Body Farm. Right. Um, so it's basically Jaime Massan came and met with Tim Burchett and was like, we were trying to figure out how we can prove that these things are alien mummies. And Tim Burchett yeah. was able to secure some funding for the University of Tennessee to uh, spend $660,000 to improve the genotyping of older and long decomposed skeletal remains DNA. Um, so they're going to look at this with their most advanced stuff and try to figure out if this is uh, legitimately an alien or if there's something else going on here. Yeah. So I, if I have a, a, a direct question for you, it's just what do you think about this story? Does this seem to you like not just this particular story, but the whole mummy thing in general? I mean, it's tough to tell, uh, you know, conclu conclusively. But, yeah, I find this interesting, right? Like that they're going to look into it. That's what we wanted. That's what we said. So I'm all for it. Have them look into it. I think the bigger question is, are we going to accept the results that comes from the testing? Right. And what is the, what is, what are the goalposts and set them now? If that, does that make sense? Right. Instead of, oh, well, we got these results. Let, let's keep testing. Let, let's get, let, let's go to that, you know, until you get what you want. So I, you know, I don't know what's going on. There's a lot of other stories that do, do, do alarm me a little bit, like some giants and they have giant skulls that they're going to be releasing. And I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Do I want to see that? Hell yeah. Giant skull. This sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Um, but, you know, it's kind of getting a little like they got hundreds of them. It's like, what the hell? I don't yeah. know, man. Um, I don't know. I feel like the mummy thing keeps coming up. And uh, every time I think it goes away, it comes back up again, and then it goes away, yeah. and then it comes back up again. <laughs> and the explanation that that made the most sense to me that I heard, and this was a while back, back, but this was from Steve Mara, who did a he actually did a documentary on this, and they flew to Peru and spent, uh, geez, it was weeks shooting this thing, and they went all over the country. And what he found out was that there is, it's it's a like a mummy factory. They have like they have shops set up where they take bits and pieces of different animals and bones, and they basically build these mummies because on the black market, if you have an alien mummy, the little ones, yeah. I think they were a hundred thousand dollars is what they were getting, and then a bigger one, like a full size adult one, was more like two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And that's no, like a whole side hustle business that this sort of sure. underground group does. And so I was like, well, that kind of settled it for me but then i keep seeing the story pop up again and again and i'm just like i wonder if there is a there there i haven't looked at it too much yeah that's kind of the i agree uh, there's there's some things that kind of go both ways so i'm with you there uh, I, to me i'm all for them uh looking into it and seeing what sort of shakes out of that tree um you know a million dollars of it, the, the question would be if we start spending taxpayer money then I think you could start to have a stronger opinion on this stuff. That I think sense. it is taxpayer you know? money. I think it's a grant. It's a oh, it's, is it? Yeah. Oh, well, then I might have to rethink this. Um, well, his thing, he says in the article, Burchett says that uh, he's like, well, let's bring him here and let's have our guys look at him at, at our university and then we'll know. You know, it's like, that'll settle it. It's not going to be like some place that no one's ever heard of uh, doing sure. some forensic analysis and uh, no one's going to check the data this will be apparently widely shared widely shared and a really highly skilled team of of people who know what they're doing and this is all they do yeah no let's go for it again it, the question is be better in my opinion asked are we going to accept the results is is this the examination that the results will be you know sort of determining okay if we get x results what are we going to do with those results, right? Are we going to stop? I mean, let's be real. You just think, you know, if Jaime Masson gets the results back, they're like, no, this is fake. or so, I mean, what results is he going to get back that he can't sort of interpret another way? I, I have a feeling this might just go forever. I feel like that's the problem with this whole field, though. It's like everything just goes forever because it's like, well, there's a UFO. No, it's not. Well, I just saw You're it. Right. You're right. Uh, there's You're right. an alien. It can uh, go forever.
No, it's not. You know, like there's always just someone who's like, and you're like, well, what's the, that's what I think disclosure, like an official government disclosure would sort of represent like moving on to the next, like a turning of the page when you get over this. 100%. But what would it take? I mean, what else would it take if the government doesn't come forward and make it official? What would it take for you, for example? Like, what would you need to see when, for you to go like, okay, this is, this is a real deal. I'm, I'm moving on. You know, I have thought about that question a lot, to be honest with you. And I've come up with, I think, the perfect answer. Okay. (laughs) That's the perfect answer. The perfect answer is, for me anyway, is just, I don't know what I would need to see till I see it. If I'm being honest, you know, or here or whatever, like I wouldn't know till it happen like i I, you know what what am i going to know is going to convince me it doesn't make sense like yeah you say well video well how do i know maybe maybe it wouldn't you know so much video maybe that wouldn't maybe that you know how are they presenting it to me like it just i don't know till i see it you know essentially but again i've definitely seen a lot of smoke and there's a lot of shit going on and there is things flying around we don't know what they are and and you know trained professionals are interacting with them, you know, and if we take the bubbles out further, CE5, remote viewing, okay, these are sort of, you know, fringe, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but sort of fringe topics, even within the UFO community, and that's where things get a little more murky for me, I'm not going to lie, right, that goes into sort of a lesser percentage category of things, there's a lot of compelling stories, I've had people tell them straight to my face, of things they've seen, heard, witnessed experienced you know i don't know it, it's definitely compelling but like this one thing stories aren't going to do it for me even a thousand of them at the end of the day you know me personally you've got to you see know. something you need to see it maybe i don't yeah. know again i don't know till it happens till that till that thing happens whatever it is maybe i have my own experience and I that think that's like fair. Yeah. takes me over the edge you know honestly i just there's no way to tell i i i have zero clue what that smoking gun thing that would send me over the edge you know it's like the uh i was talking to somebody the other day about the phoenix lights sighting and all these mass sightings and i'm like the phoenix lights if you go watch that original video it's spectacular i mean it's unbelievable you see like this thing it's either one craft that's the size of of multiple football fields floating over phoenix and you have everybody from like Kurt Russell flying in his own private airplane, looking out the window, seeing it. He's talking about it. All these people on ground, everybody's getting video from different angles. If yeah. that's not enough, then what would it take? And I, I wonder sometimes like if the whole disclosure conversation is kind of a moot point, does it have to be like an individual experience that each person has on their own? And that's the thing that's going to make people believe, yeah. or does it have to be some kind of official declaration that comes out? I feel like there's yeah, two conversations, right? Like disclosure is a legal conversation. It's going to be, it's going to boil down to money and courts and patent law and sure. like the legal machinations of uh, all this hidden technology. Yeah. And then there's like the personal side of it. And that's a lot more, like you said, it's a little more murky. It's like you have to either experience something yourself or you have to really trust the person that is telling you the story. And there's so many stories. It's just, it's tough to know. Have you, you know, seen we a... Did a- we we did a video recently on Phoenix Lights. So for anyone that hasn't checked that out, just released it over the weekend. Our whole community got together and helped the Discord, and we put it together. Can you talk so, about that a little more? What was the... Yeah, yeah, we just covered the Phoenix Lights. We're doing one every month. Our next one is the Min Min Lights. We're going to be uh, working on that um, for this month. We're, we'll be recording next, next Wednesday, a week from today. Uh, yeah, just getting the whole better community involved to look into one particular event. And I chose the Phoenix Lights first just because it was familiar, big mass sighting. I wanted to do something like that. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting case. Um, it's an hour and a half long video. You know, it, it took a long time to make and had a lot of help. And yeah, I find that case fascinating. It's still, I, even after all the work we did about it, I still feel it's unresolved. You don't think it's resolved? Like, for no. you... Even the official declaration of its flares, I don't even buy that. I don't buy that. Yeah. I, don't, I was I don't talking to somebody the, about that the other the day. I don't stories. Yeah. There's so many of these, and it's like, well, that brings me to my next question. So the Phoenix Lights footage is pretty, 
like self-explanatory. Anybody who watches that sees what, you know, we're all looking at the same thing. And I think that's kind of the, that's one of the key things. We all have to be able to see the same thing at the same time and agree that it's real, which is really hard for anything this, these days. Absolutely. Um, but then you right. have whistleblowers, right? Like you have people who come forward with extraordinary stories. And I'm wondering, like, have you heard anything yet from any of these people? Like there's, uh, of course, Elizondo and Grush, and then there's Herrera, and there's all the people Stephen Greer's brought forward, and just tons of whistleblowers have stories. Has, yeah. has there been one yet that's really felt legit to you or that you find extremely compelling? Or do you take them all sort of with a grain of salt? It's kind of comes down to how do you define whistleblower? You know, I had Danny Sheehan on my podcast and he told me that he doesn't think David Grush is a whistleblower and he explained why, right? And we call him the UFO whistleblower. I do too, all the time, right? So I'm just even confused on what a whistleblower is. Right? What was his what are, what are take they on blowing that, the whistle on? Um, well, it was like he's he's more of leading an investigation of whistleblowers. Okay, does that make sense? Like he interviewed whistleblower, but he himself is not the whistleblower. I see. So it's like does the second hand, third hand. Yeah, exactly. Um, right now, you know who other people that you know are they whistleblower? I mean, I don't know. No. I mean, I've, I've more learned who not to sort of focus on and other people, it's just kind of like, I don't know, you know, I think at this point, yeah. firsthand, the people that have touched the craft, Danny Sheehan has said the same thing to me. That's who needs to come forward next. People who have touched the craft worked actually in these programs, you know, even Danny is like, no, we need those for enough of, you know, people telling these story, you know, we, we need more people coming in. Who, who have actually done this stuff. And supposedly he's, he's worked with them. He's representing it. He's met them and they have met behind the scenes. They haven't come out publicly, right? but you know, they've met behind the scenes and hopefully that's who potentially will testify at the next hearing because where do we go from there? Right. Do we just keep having hearings and letting people, I heard from a guy or I heard from these people, eventually we're going to want to write Congress. People are going to be like, where's the person? Where's the person that, 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 that yeah. did this? Actually, let's let's this is all be it. Let's just get to the let's get to the point. Right. Let's get to the person. Let's get to the. The nucleus of it all. That is a great segue for the next thing I want to show you, because. Um, well, by the way, been... there's a guy on Twitter who goes by whistleblower now and he's trying to come out as a whistleblower. So really? that's how ridiculous this got a little bit. That's a little ridiculous. Right? He named himself whistleblower. Come this on. whole space is so Sorry. interesting because it's Sorry. like you have all these, these personalities. No, jump in anytime, man. This is uh, this, we we play it fast and loose over here. We're, just, we're not as, as put together as people think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, right? So I want to talk about I want to talk to you about Dan Burrish, and yeah. um, let me set up Dan Burrish for anybody who hasn't gotten um, please please into this yet. There's a guy. <laughs> There's always a guy, right? There's, There's a, a guy, guy. yeah. <laughs> it's always this is how they all start. Now this story gets better the longer you uh, look at it. So it's like yeah. at first it's gonna sound like complete horseshit, but the the longer yeah. you look at it, the more it starts to really like take shape. There's a guy who goes by the name Dan Burrish or Dan Crane. He's got he goes by two different names. He's changed his name when he got married. Now, this guy claims to be or to have been a biologist who worked at Area S4 on an actual alien or an extraterrestrial that goes by the name J-Rod or the terminology J-Rod is what they use. And he explains this in the clip, what J-Rod means and where that comes from. Now, I've been looking at this story a lot lately because one, it's fascinating. I think it's just a great story. If, it's, if all it is is a story, this guy is like an Academy Award winning actor. He's like, forget Paul Giamatti, like whoever this guy is, that's your guy. So the story itself is really good, but he tells okay. it with a lot of detail. And so when people have been asking about, you know, regarding whistleblowers, who are the people who have touched the craft? Who are the people who have actually worked on this stuff? Yeah. This guy He's comes of off them. as one of those people. And I want to show you some clips of him talking about what he did. I want you to pay particular attention to the way he explains what he's saying. And then I'm just going to get your opinion. So I'm not going to. Set it and up I haven't any more seen any of this, okay, y'all? Just for people watching, 
I've made sure not to watch, so this will be my raw reaction to seeing Dan Burris speak. I don't. I haven't even heard anything. So I've seen pictures of him, though, so I know what he looks like. So shout out to the chat again, everyone in the chat watching, listening. <laughs> hey, chat people. Let's go. Yeah, hit me with it, Clint. I'm super excited about this. I've been waiting. Dan oh. Burrish. Dan Burrish. Okay, here we go. So let's take a look. I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to do... Okay, so... In this clip, he's he's talking about the first time he came into contact with the extraterrestrial. That's the setup. Can you describe in detail the first time, what it was like to meet this being for the first time? It's my original feeling was I was looking at a giant insect. It's the best I can I can you know you know just you know off the cuff. It, it looked like a giant insect. Um, being dark brown, hunched in a corner, uh, very insectoid in appearance. It almost looked like it had an exoskeleton. Um, I felt afraid inside because I was always told that monsters weren't real. And now I find out they are, but they live in the heart of men. Um, uh. It was fear excitement, um, complete astonishment is honest. Honestly, I thought we were dealing with some sort of uh, monkey, um, you know, something like an old world ape or, uh, or the like, but um, indeed it wasn't. That's what my feeling was. This, you know, I'm not going to lay on and talk about <laughs> how, how uh, uh, intellectual I was at the time uh, about it, uh, um, what, what, scared the hell out of me. What did terms of that when you first confronted with the idea that it was you know, a non-human being, an extraterrestrial, or something not of this world? So? I'm trying to remember um, what I was feeling when I was looking at the briefing books. Because even when we were first introduced to the J-Rod, um, they were him hawing around as to its origin, his origin. Um, poppycock. I didn't, I didn't believe it initially. I didn't believe it. Uh, however, um, you know, deep inside, I held open the possibility because of what happened to me earlier in my life. Um, I held open the possibility uh, that such things could be true. Um, but wouldn't happen to me. Put it to you that way. It's that old, that old, you know, can't happen to you uh, feeling. So I, to me, it was poppycock. It was rubbish until I found out otherwise. All right. What do you think? Hmm. Put my investigative glasses on. Uh, I'm just <laughs> kidding. That's interesting. When, when was that video done? That was 2000. I want to say it was 2001 or 2002. Early 2000s. Okay. It, it kind of looks like a, like, a, like a scene from Lost. Like, you know, he's part of the whatever program. <laughs> um, it does. Okay. So like 2001 and he's claiming he worked Roswell in the 40s? No. The crash... Took, I believe it was the Kingman crash where they supposedly retrieved these beings. There were oh, I think, got it. three beings in the crash. And then one was sent to Los Alamos, one was sent to S4, and he was one of the biologists who was working on on this. And so the, the story that comes before this is how he basically gets recruited into this program. He's just this really bright researcher, and he gets recruited in, and then he talks about, like, this is what it was like the first time I walked into the room and saw this thing. So how old is he in that video? He's got to be 50s, maybe mid-50s, I would think. 53. That's, impo 54. that's impossible, then. What do you mean? Well, if the Kingman crash was 1953, or he's saying he dealt with the body much later, like in the 70s. Oh, well, the, the, so the E.T. is alive at the time that he worked on it. It's still alive. And then we're going to get to that. There's another clip. There's more clips. So he worked on it like in the 70s or 80s or something. He's saying he worked on it in the 90s and the, oh, the, the late 90s, 80s, sorry. early 90s. 
Okay, okay, got it. Okay, okay. Because li- okay, this one was a hundred, few hundred years old. They live a lot longer than we do. So it, it's been sure. around for a while, and they've been keeping it, it in this facility. So when he okay. tells this story, what's your read? What do you think? You look at his body language. You listen to the way he talks. Like, does this guy strike you as somebody who's making that up? Or what do you, what do you take away from that? I mean, that's too hard to tell. Like, I need to see him talk about something I know to be a fact. Mm. And see how he just talks about that as daily life, you know, things like that. And, you know, that's usually what I use to compare, you know, to, to something. But it's too, it's too hard to tell, right? Does he have any evidence or anything to, to, to show for anything that he's saying? It gets weirder. It gets weirder. So, okay, um, yeah. Let me go to the next he's clip. He's interesting for sure. Okay, so, so real quick before we even go to the next clip, let me do this. Let me do, I'm going to share this tab next. Jay so people, Rod. the the immediate, there was a controversy over this guy, and apparently George Knapp put out a piece that was very dismissive of Dan Burrish's story. He's like, this guy was a security guard at a casino, he's a nobody, he's just a nobody, um, mm-hmm. and everything he says is bullshit. But what's really interesting is that this nobody, who was just a security guard at a casino, is also that true? gave a... I don't know if he worked it. I think he worked in, you know, he had jobs before he did what he did this. So I don't know if he was a security guard or not, but I do know that he gave a lecture at Caltech on bioengineering called a peculiar silicate associated phenomenon by is Dan Burrish. And it's right here at Caltech, uh, Monday, March 10th, 2008, the Beckman Institute auditorium. And you can find this is available on YouTube. You can go uh, and watch this entire presentation. And this guy knows what he's talking about because for an hour and a half, he talks to an auditorium full of people about a very complex um, research project that he's working on. So this is interesting. I, I don't want to like ch- divert yeah, to that, but no, I just wanted to show you this. That, that's, is, uh, but he's not a professor there. He, he gave a lecture. Is the other Marsha McDowell, is she a professor there? Uh, they're both, that's his wife, I believe. And they're both working on the same project and he, so, so I'll give you like the cliffs notes on this project. Yeah. Basically it boils down to this. They figured out that there is a particular, um, uh, type of crystalline formation found in certain rock samples that when exposed to a particular frequency of laser or infrared, uh, some type of a pulsed laser, it generates a portal. Uh, under microscope you can see these little portals opening and closing and they've got footage of this and they have foot video footage of this stuff actually happening in their lab they ha- they show it working and they were saying how basically this you saw phenomenon, that video it's on the it's on youtube you really can look it up. oh yes. wow Holy yes shit. like okay i have questions but please continue okay so so that's the the idea and when you watch you watch the whole presentation now as a non-scientist and a non-technical expert i don't really know what i'm looking at but i know that i'm looking at somebody who is smarter than me and is you clearly like (laughs) knows how to talk to a room full of science people yeah (laughs) Uh, so i'm taking that away so now with that backstory um i'm going to show you the next clip and this is him talking about the um let's see which one is this Okay, here's the so this is the uh, clip two on J Rod. He's going to talk about what J Rod means, and I want you to just listen to this and then tell me what you think. Here we go. No idea the truth. Yes, from two reticulum four, now, but I had no idea the truth of how they came to be. Um, as I said to you before, I have never met an alien, but I have met an extraterrestrial. Um, I found out subsequent to, to uh, interactions with the J-Rod. And again, they have, they have personal names. The term J-Rod simply means 15, which was a, a basing name for where they're located, the number of light years from, from our location. So they took those names uh, and they identified through the Sigma protocols, the linguistic protocols with a rod symbol, which was a, uh, an inertia symbol, and the letter J. And in fact, that was a combination of Mayan and Egyptian numerology having to do with a rod and a J, meaning 10 and 5 for 15. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, now, 15 light years away, is that the police 876? 876, Charlie, from what I've been told. Now, he, he, he did not specifically 
tell me that that was the location, but the number 15 was mentioned. Well, they don't call it apparently Gleese 76, whatever, Charlie. How did J. Rod get here? I mean, how did he, you know, 15 light years away? But... He crashed in 63 from what I understand. What was that right? Outside of uh, Kingman. Okay. Kingman, Arizona. Right. Uh, there, there was a problem involving his physiology and his biophysiological um, communication with the craft went wrong. And of course, he's, he's ill, as we know, with the, the MGUS and the paraprotein associated problems. Um, and he crashed. And how was he, was he transported immediately from that crash site to the S4 facility? How is that I don't know. Okay. That I don't know. You don't know how he was. He came to be so. I, I I believe I believe he and uh, associates were transfer, transferred separately. Mm -hmm. um, he to the he to the uh, originally to the Groom Lake facility, okay. uh, and an associate to I believe Los Alamos. Um, I have no independent verification of where the associate went, though. All I can say is that he was there at Site 4. Hmm. He got the Kingman wrong. It's 1953. I'm sure he just misspoke, you know. I don't know. What do you think? I, probably. I mean, that's quite a difference. I'm sure he says 53 in other interviews or something. You know what I mean? That that would be my guess. Um, Give him the benefit of the doubt there. Yeah, what do you think I, about, I, you know, like, I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, I think it's interesting because you have a situation where we all want to hear from somebody who has firsthand knowledge, who actually worked in the program, right? So when I hear a story like his, what jumps out at me is the level of detail that surrounds the individual facts of the story. Like, I met an alien. Great. Well, how did you meet him? Now, if you watch like the Victor interview, the way that's set up, it's very interesting, and I'm still on the fence about the Victor interview, but there's not much to go on. Like, you see a glass, and there's a little alien head, and it looks like it could be a puppet. It could not be. Maybe. I don't know. Now, if there's a real room that actually has an alien in it or an extraterrestrial in it somewhere at some top-secret research facility, that's a very special fucking room. It's a very special room. It's going to look different than any other room you've ever been in, and it's going to have things in it that aren't going to make sense in any other context because it's built custom to hold an extraterrestrial, right? Like, this is just common sense. Well, so maybe my thinking, not. Hmm? Maybe not. Maybe not, but probably. I mean, you're talking about an no extraterrestrial. You don't think so? I don't think there's any way to know because we don't know how extraterrestrials are. We have zero don't clue. You... You know, we, we, and I get it. There's no other lens to filter through than our own human brains. Right. Right. There's that, that, that's impossible for us. But I mean, if we're being fair to the argument, there is no way to know what would be normal in a room for an extraterrestrial. I, okay, let me back up. What I'm getting at is like, they wouldn't have him just sitting in a conference room at a table playing with a phone. Like there's going to have Probably a special not. place to house this thing. That, I hope that, not. Is the assuming answer. it has like, different let's hope not yeah right like it's not going to be in the ball pit at mcdonald's there's going to be something sure. <laughs> specific for this alien like or for this extraterrestrial it's going to need di maybe different temperature different type of pressure you, there's going to maybe be so some... or think so i am uh, with you i get, I get it. It. We, we would assume based on just common sure. sense that it, it's probably sure. not going to just be a waiting room like sure. we would sit in. if you can go that far then when he describes the room that this thing is actually kept in and the level of detail that he talks about. I'm gonna play you the next clip and he's gonna talk about the clean sphere. And the clean sphere is a bubble of two inch thick plexiglass, I think material that's basically a dome. And it's where this being is kept. Listen to his explanation of this. And I just wanna hear if you still uh, have is thoughts the, about this. Real quick, is the alien interview, is that J-Rod, is that supposedly J-Rod in that video? I don't think so. Got I think it. there's okay. a, I think there's probably a real alien interview video somewhere, but I don't know if that's it. It's some, it. like you said, it's impossible to know. Sure, sure. What I'm looking for, and this is, again, like I can't solve this. I can't prove it. I can't prove it one way or the other. But I am yeah. looking for a story that has more levels of detail in it. If you worked on an alien program, you'd remember a lot of information. You'd be like, 
it's the coolest thing ever, right? Like you'd know sure. what the room looked like. You'd be able to describe it. You'd be like, oh yeah, we walked in and then you turn to your right and there's a guy here and there's a poster on the wall over here. And then I would go over to my desk and that's where all my shit was. And so listen to yeah, what he explains here about going into the clean sphere and this process that they actually had to go through and tell me what you think of this. Position. Um, following that, we would be suited. Well, we would be catheterized, plugged, uh, and suited. Um, communication apparatus was placed on our heads. Um, we had a cooling system set up. It was for all uh, intents and purposes. It was a spacesuit. It was a total encapsulated suit, something like what you would find uh, in an NASA facility. Not so much uh, something that uh, you would see, well, for instance, at uh, USAMRID or CDC, uh, that type of level four suit. It was more of a regular space type suit with joints. Uh, we were suited up, we were pressurized, uh, and then walked with our cooling system and our hosing down a ramp into the ambassadorial suite. Um, following that, we were led up a gantryway, which had been moved into position uh, by the clean sphere, which had been previously rotated up through an iris through the floor. Uh, he was held actually below the ambassadorial suite level, and that was raised up uh, as needed. What they did with him down there, he didn't say, and they didn't tell me. It was not a need to know issue. Apparently they dealt with the cleaning of the, of the sphere and all of that down there. The regular housed animal maintenance as they treated him. Um, we would be led up the gantry way. The hoses would be hooked into uh, an exterior, um, uh, interior, I'm sorry, system uh, inside the doorway, uh, which was exterior to the clean sphere. Um, and it was called the exterior system in fact, but and we would be let in, uh, the door would be closed. <laughs> and we would be pressurized inside of the inside of the gantry way. Uh, following that, there was a drum system that was set up. Uh, once there was a, an equal pressurization between the gantry way and the clean sphere, we would then be told to proceed forward. Uh, I would raise a hand uh, in, in acknowledgement. Uh, we were not supposed to talk at the time at all because uh, um, nothing verbal around the, the specimen, around the J-Rod. Um, why? I was never told, but we were not supposed to talk around the J-Rod. Um, I moved the drum system and re-hooked a secondary set of hosing inside the clean sphere, um, checked the pressurization, and once that was done, the door to the clean sphere would be closed behind me, and I would presume that the pressurization remained the same in the, the gantry way. Uh, following that, I would do my business inside of the clean sphere involving contacting the J-Rod and removing the samples. And what was the reason you were removing samples? We were removing samples to attempt a treatment, uh, a full diagnosis and a treatment for a paraprotein-related monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance type disorder, um, which had uh, various attributes to it, among which were, were a cocaine-type presence to the, to the J-Rod, cocaine syndrome type presence, um, and um, certain genetic um, um, issues involving chromosome 5 and 17, which led us to Charcot-Marie tooth disorder. Um, Malakalakalakaloui. That's all I heard. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, that is... Uh... That was a lot. What are your thoughts, Clint? What do you think, man? Oh, wait, you're muted. Or, or I can't hear you. There we go. Boom. My back. Okay. Yeah, what um, do you think, man? You hear a lot of stories in this line of work, and a lot of them are really detailed and really interesting, and there's just, they can really hook you. This is the one, this is one that hooked me. I get it. It totally. hooked me, and, and I, I have to say, like, when I watch it, my bullshit meter is pretty good. I'm not always the best at listening to it. Sometimes I ignore it, and I, to my own detriment and i you know i'll listen to things that i know are bullshit but uh, it's just not going off it's not going off for this guy i'm just i'm thinking like if you're a liar and you want to bullshit and you're that good at bullshitting people you're that good there's better ways to make a living than to go around and make up a really detailed ufo story and be a minor celebrity in a very weird corner of the internet like it doesn't make any sense 
I guess you could make some money doing like speaking gigs and stuff, but I just, I never really see the grift there. So I'm looking at this story and I'm like, it's just a lot of detail. There's almost no upside. Maybe there's something to it, but I can't say for sure. I don't know. Yeah, no, I hear you, man. I get it. It's, it's, it's enticing. It's compelling. Uh, you know, I always r never forget that, like for me personally, it, it, to judge that someone's lying on the basis of, well, why would they lie or X, X, Y, Z, right? It's like what, one thing I've learned in my 44 years, people lie about all kinds of things for nothing. People lie That's for true. nothing. For, they don't need fame or fortune or any. They just need to get through a moment or attention or so, just all I know is that people lie for all kinds of reasons. And you never know why someone would lie ever. There's probably a bazillion reasons that people making up new ones every day. So I don't know. Is that guy lying? I have zero clue. Um, is he providing any other evidence of his story? Again, that's really all that would matter to me is someone telling a story and then here's evidence with it. Cause that's what right. I need from a whistleblower too, at a hearing, not just to tell their story. Yes. Their testimony would be great, but we need evidence too, to go to corroborate because otherwise, again, someone could just tell stories. I personally don't want to fall back on, well, I mean, why would he lie? This would be the re, you know, there's no benefit. There's no, that dude, dude, people lie for all kinds of crap. Busted people live on businesses. I've ran restaurants. I've ran teams. People lie. People will have seven dead grandmas in 12 months. You know, yeah. it's it, it. People just lie, dude. I, but I'm not saying he's lying. It is compelling, dude. And I'll be honest, you know, your presentation of it is great. I've heard nothing but great things about it, first of all, from other people telling me to check out, you know, the videos that you've done on Dan Burch and the deep dive on it. And personally, it makes me want to jump in and look into him further and his story and and whatever. Right. And file away under. I don't know, but but interesting. I think I file it under away under one of the things that I like to do here is like creative speculation, but I like to speculate in the direction of likely things and i'm trying to think about like overall you know what do we know we know that there's a cover-up they're covering something what it is we can't be sure but it has something to do with aliens because we keep talking about it so it's got to have something to do with alien there's anti-gravity involved right like that's clear we see anti-gravity craft the tr3b has got there's video of it there's photos of it millions of people have seen this thing all over the world that's not fake so there's something there Gary McKinnon hacked into NASA back in, what was it, 1991 or 19, I don't even remember what year it is. And he found all kinds of weird stuff on the NASA computers there. And that's proven. Yeah. So there could be all kinds of different things going on behind the scenes. And you just have to go, okay, well, what are the most likely things? If we have craft, there's probably someone in them. We might probably have a body or two. So I like to speculate on some of that stuff. And when I find a story that's compelling and someone's telling a story that that fits sort of the outline i guess of what it looks like is probably going on i think it's yeah. kind of cool to entertain it for absolutely. a minute absolutely and go absolutely. well absolutely maybe agree more but i'm with you like you need we got to have some kind of proof at some point like that's where the rubber really meets the road so yeah absolutely of course there's, there's and there's nothing wrong with looking into all of this time you know i like is dan burr still around apparently he's still alive Dude, I would love to sit down and talk with Dan Burt, right? Like, I would love to do an interview uh, with him, you know? Um, he reminds me of Bob Lazar a lot. Apparently, they were there at the same time. Oh, they really? They worked in different things, so they don't... They even ask him about Lazar, and he's like, I might have seen him. I think I saw a guy who looked like that once, but I can't say for sure. And it's kind of a weird... It's like... A, it is like Bob Lazar, because Bob Lazar basically told a story that was equally unbelievable and then spent the rest of his life trying to defend it. He was a really good storyteller. Like he, he came across as very credible in what he was talking about. And yeah, and, and, and I get what people are saying now about Dan Burrish in the videos. And I get what you're saying now, right? The more I see of him, like, yeah, he's, he's that maybe there is something there. I, I don't know. It's, it's too hard to tell. Like BS meters are really, I need, you know, it's definitely easier for me in person. Of course, with people for of sure, course. right? Like, there's no question there. And you're seeing and maybe, a three minute clip out of an hour and a half. And long that's not, almost like, not fair to him, 
right yeah. on my end for some of it. Oh, it's bullshit. Dude, what what the fuck? What, three minutes of a guy? I'm going to sum up his entire, you know what I mean? Like, that's not fair to, to Dan uh, Burrish as well. So, yeah, I reserve. I just, I, I, you know, conclusively, I just say I don't know. And, and I do find it interesting. And it makes me want to look into him more and, and hear more from, from him and watch the rest of, of the interviews and stuff he's done. For sure, there's, 100%. There's, you should talk to, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to volunteer you, Brian, but you should talk to Brian Jackson. I, I interviewed him on the show, and he's done, um, for 20 years, he's been researching Dan Burrish, and he's actually got a paper trail that's like a mile long on this guy, and it's very interesting. It's very interesting. I, I can't say that I'm I'm uh, 100% convinced one way or the other, but I saw when when I talked to Brian for the first time, he sent me a huge PDF to prep me for the call. And then we went through a 45 minute presentation and he was just all data points on Dan Burrish for the last 20 years. What, why is it Dan Burrish out now? Why isn't he being asked to testify? Why aren't, you know, Jer the Jeremy Corbell's, the James Fox's putting them in their documentaries, the Lou Elizondo's like, why is he not involved? That's a great question. My answer to that is one, Jeremy Corbell is not the disclosure movement. He is one man. And it's important to yeah, remember that Jeremy Corbell is one guy and you should be very careful of always looking towards one guy as like the, this is the guy. And we have to wait until he says it's okay. And then it's real. I don't trust sure. that because that's very easily, people are easily manipulated and they're easily bought and paid. for. So I, I look at him as like, he's one guy. But I have an interesting Corbell tie-in and in just a second. We're going to go in a different direction. As far as I know, Dan Burrish is in hiding. He just disappeared and he just kind of dropped off the radar. Now, whether or not that's actually the case, I can't say. I don't know. I, you know, I don't have the resources to dig into it. Oh, so uh, nobody but, knows where he's at. That's even uh, more interesting, dude. We need to do a documentary, bro. Me and you getting out on the road looking for <laughs> Dan Burrish. Where is Dan Burrish? Bro, I'm dead serious. Finding this Dan is, Burrish. Yeah, uh, this is interesting. It it's this just it, got more interesting, bro. This it gets got, weirder. Y'all getting the crazy hair now. It gets weirder. Chat. This is that's what's happening. All right, let me. Someone let said me, I look like a Florida retiree. What the hell? You, you guys. look like you're on your way to Atlantic City. <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you another case. So I'm looking at a few yeah. different cases. I, I like to look at these weird cases and I, I don't, you know, like, there's no way to really solve it. It's just it's it's interesting yeah. to look at. Oh, so yeah. Burrish is one, and that's one that's been occupying a, a it's it's living rent free in my brain for a while. Yeah, um, <laughs> I get it. I but have it. you followed or heard anything about the Amy Eskridge story? Does this yeah. ring a bell? I've heard about a lot of these things. Right? It's for me to go. Oh, I know about this. I need to know a lot to make that designation. But I always know about most everything. But just on a level that probably most people do, but they'll claim I know I'm an expert on it, right? So yes, I know about. Am I an expert on her? By no means at, sure. at all. But yeah, of course I know her story and and um, you know what happened to her. And yeah, she's fascinating. What what do you got about her? So um, part of the conversation has been about what happened to Amy and and what her background is. But the, there's this whole side category of ufology around the secret space program i'm sure you've looked into the speak secret space program and you've heard people talk about it uh, to tim gary taylor McKinney. hmm tim taylor tim taylor okay so she talks about tim taylor that's going to come up in a in a clip here in a second so the speak, secret space program for me started with the Gary McKinnon story, the NASA hacker who hacked into basically a bunch of NASA computers and he found the ones that didn't have any passwords on them. And mm -hmm. so he just started searching these computers and he was finding names of ships that don't exist in any registry, supposedly Correct. orbital ships or ships in uh, deployed in space that have crew members and they had names of crew people that were on board these craft. Uh, a lot of really interesting stuff came out of that. And if you look up Gary McKinnon's story, there's a ton of, this is just for anybody who's not familiar, there's a ton of information on Gary McKinnon. and uh, Oh, his, his story's fascinating. It, it goes beyond just that the whole fight he had for 10 years to not be extradited right. uh, is another story. It, they tried to, like, He's Julian Assange story. him back in oh, the definitely. early days. Yeah, he got lucky. He, the UK decided against extraditing him. Um, uh, yeah, his story is, it's crazy. I agree. It's an I interesting think, story. And I'm not sure about this. I, it'd be interesting to ask him, but I, as far as I understand, one of the reasons that he's free now and he didn't wind up in prison was because at the time laws on computer hacking were not really fully developed yet. It was still kind of like early days. And so they had kind of loose 
laws and they were trying to like pin him down on some of this stuff and lock him up um, but they weren't really able to to make it stick i guess they, because... they they did then pass a law we did and that allowed them to go that's where you know, the 11th hour they went hard after him because he thought right. he was off and then boom years later they you know they came after him but honestly who oh he who he owes the biggest thank you to is his mother because his mother lobbied so hard and had such a big influence on getting Gary McKinnon off, essentially. That's, that was what it boiled down to. His mom did so much, so much press, getting it out there, putting the pressure, getting the, you know, the people behind him, essentially. <laughs> right? and they... it, came, it came down to, like, the wire, dude. He thought he was going to go away for a long time. Wasn't it also, like, a technicality that the computers he accessed just didn't have passwords, so he didn't break any passwords. He never broke into a system. He just walked in an open door, essentially. They, they might have used uh, something like that. I mean, that, that was the, 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 the deal, right? Like, he found a computer and was logging in at night when this woman wasn't, you know, at her thing. And it was just a woman that, like, edited photos and stuff, and, and they found, like, photos that they were working on or something. I don't know. There is more to it there. I don't want to say things I don't know. Well, this uh, is too much set up, but yeah, his story is fascinating. Just the whole roller coaster ride and everything. It's just like this ties goodness. into the Amy Eskridge story in an interesting, loose yeah. way, but it does tie in. And sure. so this is the article on um, cybernews.com. But anybody who Googles this, you'll find a ton of articles on Gary McKinnon. Oh, yeah. and, and basically, it, it, it talks about like what you just said that he was able to, he, not only did he find photographs on these machines of apparently craft that are in orbit that had been airbrushed out of the photos that nasa releases yeah but he found uh oh and he went his his handle was solo which i think is just badass totally uh, known as solo mckinnon obsessively poked around u.s government computer systems he based his actions on his obsession obsessive search for evidence of ufos and free energy this is important suppression by the u.s government solo's attempts would seem crude by today's standards a simple dial-up modem provided a 56K per second connection over standard phone lines. I remember those days. Oh, he yeah. scanned a vulnerable 139 port um, used for sharing files, printers, and other computer resources. And so he finds these systems that have blank or default passwords, and then he's able to pull up all this information. And he says here, the evidence, did he find anything? Yes. He was sure he saw images of what looked like extraterrestrial spaceships. The evidence convinced McKinnon as the pictures were kept at a building eight at the Johnson Space Center, where they regularly, this is a quote, airbrushed out images of UFOs from the high resolution satellite imaging. Here he found a folder titled Unfiltered containing strange satellite imagery with strange spacecraft, cigar shaped with a clear dome on top. Yeah. And uh, this is where he talks about downloading it, I think, because he was trying to download it and that's when he got shut down. He never got the picture because it took for, forever. It took 56K. forever. Yeah, it, it, yeah, absolutely. And I remember those days. Oh yeah. You know? And these are huge, high resolution satellite photos. They're enormous. I can't files. even imagine. So it, it would take fifteen minutes to download a photo. Um, at the time. So. Yep. So anyway, the the point of this is that it sets up this idea that NASA has been hiding technology and they have this whole like secret arm that's doing things that we don't know about. And supposedly when he breached their security and was able to find all this stuff, that kind of made it real. So how does this tie into Amy Eskridge? Well, Amy is or was scientist and researcher who ran an organization called the Institute for Exotic Science in Huntsville, Alabama, the Rocket City, which we're going to look at in just a second. And her father was a researcher for NASA. And I'm going to play you a clip now, and she's going to explain who her dad is and what, and this will start to connect in just a second. We're going to watch two sure. or three little clips, and then it's going to all come together. So let me start sure. with this one about her. Uh... So my dad was the technical lead of the advanced propulsion lab at NASA Marshall, again, the propulsion capital of the world. So I was a little autistic girl and I was listening to my dad moan and complain about NASA being inefficient and about how we could like do anti-gravity if they fucking funded us for my entire life. My brain is wired from birth, my entire development. My brain developed under the conditions 
of listening to the technical lead of the Advanced Propulsion Lab of NASA Marshall, the propulsion capital of the world, complain about how no one was funding him and he had great ideas. All right. Now I'm going to skip right to uh, the next clip, and I'm just going to play this in sequence. Let's see. Is this the one? Okay. In this one, uh, this next clip, she's talking about... um, She's talking about... Let me switch my tab. She's talking about um, researchers at NASA, researchers who have independently figured out anti-gravity technology and how that's been handled by NASA. That's the setup for this. It has been suppressed every single fucking time. And he said, I don't think they're going to suppress it this time. He said, I think you're in the clear. He, he said, they obviously know about you because I've had multiple both protective and threatening interactions with various agency affiliations, whatever. He was like, if, if you haven't had a U.S. government agent come to you and say, stop, shut the fuck up, stop, shut the fuck up. If that hasn't happened, they're going to let you do it. Oh, Amy. He said it's been suppressed every other time. This time, this time, they're waiting for someone to publish. They're ready. They're waiting. They're like, there are SSP motherfuckers that are fucking twiddling their thumbs. Like, is Amy not going to publish soon? Gah, we've been influencing this bitch forever. Doesn't she know we want her to publish? Jesus. Like, there's multiple people doing that right now. And on the other side of the fence, there's multiple parties looking at each other like, didn't we tell this bitch three years ago that we kill people for this? Is she not listening? What is she doing? She's still doing it? What? We told her we were going to kill her three years ago. So I have these two, like, I have these two different scenarios floating constantly in my life where I have people being like, do it, do it, do it. You're the one, do it. And then I have multiple people, people being like, they're going to kill you. Don't do it. They're going to kill you. I have like multiple of these whispers in my ears. I can't even describe it. It's crazy. And then I even have the people that are like, this happens too. They're like, you know, they kill people for this, right? And then they're like, because you're a young woman, they're going to rape you before they kill you too. And I have people like, I have people digging through my panty drawer, breaking into my apartment digging through my panty drawer so that I notice like I have crazy fucking threats going on right now. It's stressing me out. (laughs) And then this is the last clip that I've got. This is what she has to say. So, so she's, she's got this organization called Institute for exotic science. Their goal is, or was to, she was getting together all the NASA researchers who had these programs that they'd worked on for anti-gravity and the programs get canceled. They go nowhere and they just get shut down. Her idea was to gather all these people together and basically like take their knowledge and b- a independent group of billionaires who would just fund them to like make the shit happen. Yeah. And this is what she had to say about that effort. So watch this next clip. Yeah. I'm in Huntsville, Alabama. I know I've said that several times. We're the rocket city. We're the biggest deal you've never heard of. Von Braun was here and we won the space race. We developed the Saturn V here. We built the Saturn V here. We won the space race here in Alabama, whether you've heard of it or not. And I can tell you for a fact, so many prototypes, so many prototypes. Only prototype built like this in the world. You turn it on the first time, it works exactly like you thought it would the first time. Great data. You apply for more funding to test it more thoroughly, they cancel it. They cancel it. It goes to NASA divestment. It goes to the auction block. People bid on it. And literally, scrap metal, scrap metal, scrap metal vendors win the bid and melt it down for scrap metal and sell it. We could be crazy, crazy, crazy far. We could be on the moons of Jupiter. We could be exploring Pluto that isn't even anymore. If we had spent money differently, 
I can tell you the names of so many NASA scientists that are depressed and they want to kill themselves because they have built prototype after prototype after prototype in Huntsville, Alabama. First in the world, never before seen, worked the first time you turned it on exactly like you thought. It was canceled and melted down for scrap metal. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I've seen those videos before. I, I personally, I, it makes me sad to see someone in those kind of conditions, to be honest with you. Now, what is she talking about? It's, it's super interesting, for sure. There's no, there's no question. Um, has anyone picked up the baton, taken the baton from her? I you would think, think. when she passed away... The, it put a chill on the room, and I think everybody just kind of, like, as far as I'm aware, and I haven't looked any more deeply than these videos. Like, I've looked at the videos that are on YouTube, and that's about as far as I want to go with it because it's just too spooky for me. But uh, yeah. I also think, like, you have a guy, Gary McKinnon, who's telling us, I hacked into the system at NASA. They've got a bunch of secret stuff that you don't know about. And then you have this woman who's like, I know a ton of people at NASA, and they've got a bunch of secret shit you don't know about. And guess yeah. what? We're going to get together and try to publish some of this stuff. And then she dies. And she yeah. makes this video right before and puts it out. And she's obviously, you know, she's obviously drinking. She's clearly not in a, in a clear-headed state of mind when she's saying these things. So I don't want to, I don't want to speak, you know, out of school about something that I, I really don't understand. But I think that what I'm seeing here is, is really weird. And it makes me wonder. Uh, you know, I saw this story, it came across Reddit a few, this is probably a year ago, and I just looked at it, and every time I would put it away, it would come back up again, and I would look at it again, and I'd be like, man, what a weird interview. The reason this ties into Jeremy Corbell is apparently when she was giving that interview for to the two guys that she's talking to, she was in talks with Corbell to get with him on a project and try to basically use him as a as a outlet to get some of this information out. And apparently she was talking to Greer, or they were looking at Greer, Corbell, and um, I think uh, she mentions Richard Dolan, but I don't, I don't know the extent that Richard was involved in. So that's okay. really interesting that there's people yeah. out there who claim to be working on these projects and they're like, we're trying to come forward. We're trying to say this. We heard David sure. Grush talk about being threatened. Lou Elizondo said he's been threatened. Yeah. She just said, I've been threatened. You know, I have people breaking into my apartment, messing with my stuff. She goes into a lot more detail about what they did to like harass her and stuff. And then you look at her obituary and it's like, this is a brilliant scientist who was doing all this research. She's no longer here. And it's just a really weird, it's a weird story. I agree. I just I wonder, agree. like, you know, do, as you look at a lot of stuff, you see a ton of stories. You see a lot of off the wall things. Does this, um, what do you think this is up about there. this one? Yeah, it's up there. It's a spooky one. It's one that, that really deserves, you know, to be honest, the reason I've never covered it is because it really deserves a deep dive. Yes. And I just haven't had the time for that. But considering she's no longer with us, considering the circumstances, considering she may have been having some personal issues as well, which, which I do want to remind people. And look, I'm a skeptical as the next guy. I do want to say, that doesn't mean that what she's talking about is bullshit because she was having some sort of problems, right? Like that doesn't mean anything. In fact, those, those, uh, that shit could have drove her to those problems, right? If, if, mm -hmm. you know, just to give, just to be fair to her, uh, to this woman, but I, I think she deserves like a real deep dive on her story and what's happening. And I would be curious to know who's picking up the baton to carry some of her work or are there any plans for, her work, if she was working with other people, what do they want to do? And if, if they are feeling some sort of retribution or pushback or something, yeah, I, I, I mean, that's interesting. Absolutely. I, how could we help? How, what, what is the best way? Um, I don't know. I, I don't yeah. know. And that's the thing, right? Like people are people. Like they tried to do that with David Grush. They said, well, you know, he, he had PTSD and he was an alcoholic at the time or something happened. Yeah, total Remember bullshit. that article? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Covered it. And it's like, you, well, are, aren't people He's allowed to be guy. human? He's suing them. Good. It's like, dude, you know, people have, it, we're all human. Everybody, you know, sometimes people drink too much. Sometimes they take too many pills. Sometimes, like, who doesn't? That's life. Life is hard. Especially Absolutely. when you're carrying around, like, some crazy super secrets that you have to, like, 
walk around with this knowledge in your mind and you're like, I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. And then the pressure of that must be sure. unbearable. So it doesn't sure. shock me that people have issues. And I think it's, it seems like an easy target when they want to debunk people or, or, uh, I know, agree. I discredit. don't think it has anything to do with their merit or their credibility. That's something we can all relate to on some level on a spectrum. So sure. I agree. Uh, I don't think it should be used against Amy in any way. Um, shape or form, nor nor do I think it should be ignored just considering that interview. It's like, clearly there was something there, but I don't think that's the whole story for sure. And yeah, I mean, I mean, there's no question that there have been some people that have mysteriously, you know, not with us anymore. The, 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 the reasons around them not being with us anymore are mysterious, right? The Boeing and, guy, the Boeing whistleblower. Uh, few, that was a couple of them. A couple of them. And that was only about five, six months ago. It wasn't that long. There was a, another whistleblower that was not the Boeing whistleblower that Danny Sheehan talked about um, that worked on the program who lost their life and they were looking into under what circumstances. And that's why Lou put out that big statement of I've been threatened. I've been, that was because of that. Right. Um, and yeah, that, that, that was definitely uh, interesting for sure. But then when I asked Danny Sheehan again about it, he couldn't confirm or deny if it was a whistleblower that worked in the program. Right. Okay. So, so even though he again, had said it in the space, when I asked him to confirm, he's like, I can't talk about it anymore. Yeah. It's like, so yeah. yeah, there, I agree. There are things out there and let's be real. If that, if that's a real program and there's real shit happening, of course they're going to do what they need to do to cover it up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if they're worried about ontological shock for the whole world, they're not going to make a few people disappear. Yeah, we make right. people disappear for chicken nuggets. You know, you, you can, I mean, like, 100%, that is totally possible um, for some of these things to happen. And not just possible, probable. Probable. That it's happening, is, yes. right? Probable. That the people are being threatened in all kinds of different ways. And probably they are even responsible for a lot of the misinformation that you hear as well. Oh, I'm sure. Because that's, that's, a, that's even more effective than, than anything, is making you question what's reality. Well, that's the real question. It's like, yeah, you can never get to the bottom of it. There's no end to it. There's always going to be some level. That's the thing that's so frustrating and at the same time so fun about all this. It's like some percentage yeah. of it's not true, <laughs> but yeah. some percentage of it is true. I agree. And it's just like... Wow, sure. man. Well, what, what, it doesn't matter like which percentage is true. Any of it, if any of it's true, it's crazy. So we Absolutely. get to play this game where we're like, let's look at it and let's talk about it and let's, let's see what, you know, what happens. And then every once in a while, someone disappears and you're like, Ooh, that's weird. <laughs> you know, there's like, a, there's like legislation moving through Congress and you're like, Oh, that's interesting. So you see I mean, these, like you said, smoke Absolutely. signals. Yeah. Absolutely. And just the millions of people worldwide who have had experiences, no matter how, bonkers they may seem there's just a lot of people either either humans are just inevitably crazy or we got some shit going on or a little bit of both probably if i'm being honest there's some shit going on and people are a little crazy uh but yeah man look we only need one story to be true man only one and it changes true. everything dude and you know uh, i'm with you on that okay I'm going to show you one last one, and then we're going to wrap it up, because uh, I'm going to end on a fun one, though. That was a little heavy, so let's see if we can lighten the mood. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it gets yeah, heavy. Yeah, you play your funeral clip next. I'm like, Jesus <laughs> Christ. Jeez, dude. Oh, my God, bro. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I, I try to, I, you know, I, I talk about it, and I try to do it in the most respectful way I can, because it's like, you know, it's sometimes tough. there's an I elephant in the room, and you got to be sure. like, you have to be the guy who's like, there, there's yeah. an elephant right there, right? Totally, we're yeah. all seeing the same elephant, right? Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, okay. No, you, you, you handled it well, man. So this next one is a tweet. You probably saw this tweet. I don't know if you covered it on the channel, but Dave Navarro, a George Knapp tweet. Did you see this? Sound familiar? Uh, Jeremy Corbell came into my chat and, um, the next day, uh, on my live stream on Sunday and confirmed, I believe my theory on it, which was that it was a joke. A joke. That's what I thought initially. I was like, oh, this is a joke. He's just joking around. And I'm pretty sure Jeremy Corbell confirmed it in the chat 
um, that it was a joke. I could be wrong. Someone in the chat say who was there. I see some of my mods are here. Um, Y'all, they can confirm because they're really paying attention to the chat. But Jeremy was there and I was talking about it. So made me bring it up. But yeah, dude, what a great picture. And Jane's addiction, baby. What a, yeah, what a great picture. But this whole date, like, I'm afraid picture. it's still classified. You may not want to make any plans March 3rd, 2026. Well, you yeah. won't actually have a choice. If it is a joke, it's a great one. If it's not a joke, uh, that's a great cover. I, d d I mean, yeah, I guess yeah, uh, right, like, they'll always say that. Um, yeah, I think they were joking. Uh, there were some other people with the band who also tweeted out some stuff to go along with the joke. Like, they put that date on one of Dave's guitars. Like, there was a joke about that date. And, you know, that, that's what I think. Um, there's no way they're there's telling no. Dave Navarro Dave classified Navarro. information who then puts it on Instagram. Right? Well, <laughs> like that's Tom DeLonge and Dave Navarro. Like, all these musicians have the inside scoop on all of us. Yeah. Yeah. They start a super group, right? A cosmic super group because they're all in the know. That's to, by like, the way, have you have you heard of, funny. what's going on with Tom DeLong lately? Has anybody heard anything from Tom? Is he still uh He's got a new book uh coming out? Um he's just been touring with Blink 182, dude. The dude, the Blink 182 tour is like massive, bro. And it is that's a massive just tour. I mean I I mean running a fucking stupid YouTube channel I run takes up all my time. This guy's on tour, global tour with a band. Like, I can't even imagine he has time for anything else. But no, he does have another book coming out. Um, and they just had a book come out. He just had Is this a, a one book of the out, Secret Machine series? One. Yeah. Exactly. He had A.J. Hartley's one that he co-wrote with them uh, about the, the bomb. What's it called? Something. I can't, I can't think of the name right now. And then there's another Secret Machines coming out that Peter Leyenda has been doing interviews um, about. There's a really good one on engaging the phenomena. I recommend uh, going to check it out. That's hosted by James Iandoli. Have you, Peter, um, Peter Leyenda is the author of the Secret Machines. With have you gone through the Tom. series yourself? Parts of it, parts here and there, but I haven't like read the whole books or anything like that, but I've definitely read a ton of excerpts and just things that I found online about it. Do you have a take on whether or not there's a there there? They say it's, it's interesting. A soft I think it's super interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I find that fascinating. That's what made me want to look into it. it look, it, it, yes, is it fascinating? For me, it is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's all fascinating. Is it, you know, at the end of the day, is there's something there there? I have no clue. <laughs> I'll never know. I'm the last one that's going to find out. You, no, you, no one's, that's no one's running to Patrick to tell me about aliens. I, I love, that's actually one of the reasons I love doing these like back and forth with you because you bring me back down to earth. You're like, all right, man, just like come back down to earth. Sometimes I get a little, <laughs> I run a little wild with the uh, speculation. I'm like, ah, bro, we need I am that, the guy though. with the yarn and the, and the thumbtacks. That's me. We I'm need that, that dog. No, no, we need that. We need that. I like that's why I like Vetted's community. It's made up of people who are staunch believers, staunch skeptics, and everything in between, all all cohabitating. And I love that because I think if you're very skeptical, it's important to have people around who aren't as much to kind of keep you balanced. And the other way, I think if you're very much a believer, have some skeptical friends. Like I think that's good to keep the balance of. You know, but I don't feel what a person should lean one way or the other at the extreme, you know, just dismiss everything and just call it all bullshit and just say everyone's a liar and F everything and or the other way. Everything's real. And it's all, you know, because that's also not helping anything. So, you know, I think it's it's nice to have that balance. Dude, that's so, what the community I, so if you get excited, so... right, you get excited, yeah. you get going about something, dude. I Absolutely, bro. I think that's cool. And I think that should be celebrated. It's a, it's important. And I think you guys, you've got a great community over at vetted and for anybody watching, if you're not already a subscriber, go over to vetted and subscribe, get involved and be a part of what they're doing over there because uh, you do have oh, a yeah. great channel, man. And it's been awesome to watch it grow. You've just taken off and it's just cool. It's like, we kind of jumped into this at the same time and I've just watched you just launch this thing. And it's so cool yeah. to watch. No, man, I appreciate that. And you as well, man, you've been doing great. I saw a video you just put out recently that did really well, dude. Yeah, that did pretty right? well. I was actually pretty impressed. Uh, it did pretty well. I got to I no, got to yeah. find that guy who directed that teaser or the music video. Get him on. Uh, there you go. That'd be a good yeah. follow up. That'd be cool. Is there anything else you want to 
tell the people before we wrap for the day? We're going to go ahead and. I just want to say thank you to everyone that took the time to watch the stream, comment, uh, anyone that's supporting Night Shift. Thank you. As creators, like, guys, this it is really hard. And, like, it does, even if we don't admit it, you know, little comments here, support here, there, little things go a long way to help us keep doing this stuff. And, like, you know, for me, like, as an ex-chef, I remember, like, I, I could have the worst day in the world, but if I saw someone eat my food, and just I would see a, a change, like a smile, like a like they just had like a heavenly experience. I, it was just like, it's all worth it, man. That's why we're here. So seeing the chat today, being on the other end of this and sitting with you um, and seeing how the chat's going, just like it, it's that's it for me. Like, it's cool. I, I, like, why we're here? Why do we do this? Clint, right. Like, I never want to forget. It's the people watching, listening. It's why I do what I do and put in the dedication that I do. It's it's not really so much about me, but about everyone else that's watching. So I just thank you for the time that they put in because they could be doing other things. And they chose to uh, hang out with us and they choose to support me on my channel. They choose to support you on your channel. So I just want to say thanks to the peeps, man. Likewise, it's awesome to have a great community, and it's just it's cool to watch it grow. And it, and, and you're awesome too, dude. I mean that. I, I'm thanks. super happy that we did our <laughs> video. It did really well. And forget that it didn't do well. It's just cool to hang out. Like we get along. So yes, I think you know. Look forward to us doing more things in the future for sure. People are wondering. We'll, um, we'll I, figure I'm down out. For uh, it. We'll figure oh, yeah. out some kind of a, a format, and I'll get my uh, I'll get my software working a little better next time. What do you mean? Well, you did great, dude. This is great. Yeah, it's a little clunky in the, in the beginning, but I know how it is. I'm, I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> Please. Uh, Patrick, thanks, man. It's been awesome. It's great to catch up with you, see what you're up to, and to get your quick takes on some of this stuff. And uh, yeah, man, let's do it again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Cliff. All right. Thank you to everybody who's watching. Thank you for participating in the chat. Thanks for being a part of what we're trying to do over here. It is your participation that makes all of this worthwhile. I wouldn't do it if no one showed up. So the fact that you guys keep showing up and you like it and you support us and you have positive words of encouragement, that, that Patrick's right. That stuff is worth everything. A lot of times it's just like, I know, Patrick, you know what it's like. You're in a room, you're just talking to the computer or the camera and you're, you know, you sort of feel like you're in a bubble. So it's cool to get that community going and really feel like everybody's contributing to the same thing. And, and we're all part of this, this weird moment as weird as it is. Right. Um, all right. We're going to go ahead and wrap it there. I'll uh, follow up with you offline. And in the meantime, yeah. Thanks for watching guys. Thanks guys. Peace. Some balloons to celebrate.